Um, I think while, while it does that, um, probably we've, we've ourselves undergone a bit of an evolution from the beginning of the workshop to where we are right now. I think that's the, the measure of a successful workshop, is that things have changed um, during the course of it. Uh, one of them is that, I mean, personally I don't think it's necessary for us to actually take a vote on any kind of a concept. Um, I think we've illustrated quite clearly and uh, quite sufficiently amongst all of us that research questions do drive methods. Um, from the beginning, these are the things that determine the choices of terms uh, we wish to use. Um, and that, indeed, if we wish to achieve greater research clarity uh, for our particular questions, that our definitions need to equally be as broad or, def or, or precise as, as is necessary. I think all of us uh, probably either came with that intention or, or have developed it as a result of today's discussions. And for that, I thank everyone in this room. Um, it's been quite remarkable. Um, for us in Southern Africa, uh, if we wish to document uh, patterns of lithic miniaturization, that is, if that is a research question for us, which I do think is an incredibly important one in our region, we do need a broader definition of microliths than just retouch tools. Um, and moving forward, that is something that we will have to adopt um, in order to fit the record that we are looking at um, and its variability. So this is something that I think fits a mold uh, larger than definition one, which a lot of people have used, small retouched tools, um, and leaves out of it small and retouched flakes and bladelets. Um, so uh, modification is something that is critical to the definition, um, as is size. Um, the second definition of purely backed tools, um, defined by a research question in Australia and in regions that have uh, periods of, of, of the record in Africa that have significant backing, requires a definition more like number two. Um, leaving out small and retouched flakes and bladelets again. Um, number three, small retouched tools, some of them backed, uh, and unretouched bladelets, the Elston and Kuhn definition that uh, you started with Elston, that quite a few people seem to have adopted in one way or another, um, is broad, and it really does fit a range of research contexts. Um, and so I think that you could answer a number of questions with this methodology. It's not necessarily one defined by a question, um, but it's still, it still leaves unresolved for us, at least in Southern Africa, the question of small flakes um, as a purposeful strategy. And the last one, um, backed and retouched bladelets, and bladelets as long as they are standardized, uh, so the focus being on, on the shape of a tool, um, rather than its size necessarily, although size features in the definitions of some parts of the world um, that employ Tixia's uh, version of this, uh, is again something that would work for specific research questions and in, in our particular region, uh, after the last glacial maximum, perhaps this is a definition that could work. But if we, for, our, for us in Southern Africa, if we don't adopt some version of of small flakes in the definition, we're blunted to see the relationship between bladelet production and small flake production through time, uh, broader processes of lithic miniaturization. So, um, I think these are all these are the four major definitions that we felt were sort of employed today in various methods or or in various case studies or another, um, and none of them sort of dealt with the small flake issue, um, which is something that I think we need to deal with in Southern Africa, and it may not be a universal requirement for all assemblages, but it seems to be one that is necessary for our particular region, and if the research question is necessary uh, in Southern Africa, the uh, definition needs to be adopted uh, accordingly. But Francois, I think your, your point more broadly that what we're probably looking at on a macro scale is the interest in miniaturization of artifacts, um, not necessarily the microlithization. Um, this is a process that we can link to modern contemporary technological phenomena. Technological phenomena, uh, miniaturization is something we use every single day, but it's something that has ancient roots in human technology. Um, and that 
if we adopt definitional specificity, so I think Stan and Steve in particular have highlighted this, that each publication needs to define very precisely what they mean by microlits. And if they do that um, in supplemental material or in the text, um, and then move to demonstrate levels of intentionality, like you point out, Francois, um, I include something else beyond, beyond the third of the three of yours, because I think the, the three are quite similar. T uh, technology, uh, use, uh, geology. I include a fourth, which is the middle range theory. I think that we need also an ethnographic model or an experimental one to explain the pattern that we're trying to work with, um, whether it's function hunting, whether it's the use of small unretouched flakes, whether it's bladelets, uh, any of these things I think need to be underlined by a middle range theory, is so something uh, that links the patterns observed in the record to the theory that we're trying to attain, the behavioral record, um, which in this case is driven by the interest in, lith in a broad process called lithic miniaturization um, that can be defined in many ways based in different parts of the world for specific regions um, and, and uh, for specific research questions. So I think th that's really all that, uh, you know, that, that, that's what I feel really came from the workshop. Um, and if there is need from anyone in the room to add a definition to that list of four that you think is important or, you know, I, by all means, let us know, or because we are going, to, we do intend to write the workshop up, um, and so and include sort of all of you as an attendee, and and so part of the idea is to tabulate all those definitions that were used today, um, as a way to kind of have that record somewhere. Um, so if there's something that you feel like we've missed, please by all means let us know, um, or if there are things you want to add right now, uh, Stan. Could we back up to the list before? Um, Small flakes never got out of parentheses here. Yeah. Now, um, part of the reason small flakes may not have ever gotten out of parentheses is that there's nothing of interest to illustrate, even though we may uh, describe them in print. In, um, for example, Matupi Cave has about 20,000 years worth of small flakes that are not bladelets, and we know about this. Uh, the first white ash at Border Cave it really is nothing to illustrate. They illustrate the, the uh, acacia thorns, the ostrich egg shell bits, but not the lithics. We know these things exist. I have two assemblages in the Intuka River, different sites that are just small flakes. Uh, really nothing that archaeologists traditionally communicate about to communicate about, because uh, they're not shaped tools. So uh, we can take small flakes out of parentheses, I think, here for L's definition. Would you mind that? The, the number three was attributed to you. <laughs> because, you know, uh, this is, these are widespread. And everybody who's excavated one has called it later Stone Age and microlithic in some sense. <laughs> you haven't excavated it, Steve. Neither of you excavated anything that might be transitional. You have a huge gap in your stratigraphic section. What if you didn't? <laughs> you might think it different too. And um, Rose Cottage Cave as well. Right? You, you, number three was attributed to you. But this is the Elston and Kuhn definition. Oh, that oh else, Elston. Yes, that Els used in her presentation. Right. I used the Kuhn Elston definition right. to show that for the quartz assemblages it did not work, whereas it worked perfectly <coughs> for the Chitolian, which was in the same time frame yeah. and in the same area. But it was not a plea to include small mm. flakes. It was no, just no, an I, observation yeah. to. It works in some instances and it doesn't in. in I, I suppose just to sum up my proposition here is we make number five, number three without the parentheses around small flakes. Yeah, just include it. Yep. I'll draw them until we find this. I'll draw my um, two more flakes. Yep. I mean, this is essentially. Um, also, Lincoln's definition, yes. Um, 
And that's, you know, again, I think for us in Southern Africa, the, we do have periods that do not contain small flake production. Uh, yeah. Large flakes are the norm. And so we, in our, in our region, do have the necess necessity of a definition that includes small flakes. But again, it's not a, we're not trying to seek universal definitions here. Um, I think the idea is that this is dependent on your region and your research question. Um, and that the, uh, the definition should fit the kinds of patterns that you're seeing um, <coughs> and be well, widely, widely testable in certain regions. Uh, the, the point I want to emphasize is that these occur in Pleistocene assemblages that are called later Stone Age in East Africa, Central Africa, and South Africa. Mm -hmm. So it's not a region-specific uh, phenomenon. And so number five still does not have small flakes on it. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm unclear. What, what are you looking for, Stan? Did I add? It, it just remove the, par uh, the parentheses and, and just include small flakes in the entire definition. Yes. Uh, retouch bladelets, Sorry. comma, small yep. flakes. Yep. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Is that, that, that's, well, still not there. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> number three becomes number five. Number three becomes number three. And we'll remove number five. We'll switch, yeah, three and five. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I can make how small with your, with your small flakes. So we've, we use a, uh, so in this, at, in Planet Sawana, everything is, the mean, the modal pattern is uh, 25 millimeters. Uh, everything is below 50 millimeters in length. And how do you distinguish between a small flake production and most of things under 2.5 millimeters we disregard in the Middle Stone Age. Well, that's a problem. Methodologically, the Middle Stone Age needs to study its small... I just want to say, in the Middle Stone Age, there are many small flakes, small complete flakes. But the, core, the intentionality, the first um, aspect of intentionality is the technology. So it, it technologically, this, the cores are small yeah. with small flake scars. And yeah. we don't really pay attention to them, but they are there. But no, and I think that I don't think that the that mic that microliths di uh, differentiate the middle and later stone age. Um, okay, I should have said this earlier, but I wasn't here. Yeah, I think Stan showed this quite well as well that you get MSA with microliths and I would say two. So simple, small small terms. Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I still don't quite understand why you want to have that digitalistic. Why can't you just say we have small, unretouched tools? Why do you need a term, another term? I'm, yeah, I'm looking. I'm, I'm, no, again, I think I, we've. I don't quite get it. The discussions that, that, that seem to have gone on today after my presentation, as you know, people seem to feel like there isn't a need for a new term. Um, what I presented in the beginning was the suggestion that we think about. Uh, that if this is a pattern that is worthwhile documenting, that perhaps it's worthwhile naming as well. Um, and that the existing terminology are not appropriate, and therefore a new name, if this is the direction we choose, could be this. But the discussions uh, seem to have evolved away from, from their needing, to, or not evolved, not that they ever were, but have... Well, I'm willing to accept that. This is, if you show us more specifically why, Important. I think, in, and I, sh I showed with, with the Inkloan and Tawana assemblage that in Southern Africa we have patterns of lithic miniaturization that involve small flake production and use. And to document the antiquity and the variability in these processes, I think it's worth describing them under the umbrella framework of a, of a, of a new concept. Um, and then others will just say, I don't have it. <laughs> I don't see the tutorial. And. I think that addressing Francois's suggestion and others that this is linked to, thing, to patterns of mobility, to raw material variability, we can start explaining it. Uh, why do people do this? Uh, at Nkloa and Tsawana, it seems like people are not, it's not high mobility. Uh, well, I think mobility needs to be broken into residential and logistical. At Nkloa and Tsawana, we have low residential mobility. In other words, lots of cores on site, lots of reduction on site, materials are coming to the site. But we have fishing in rivers nearby that suggest high logistical mobility. Uh, so I think that's another factor is that you can, militarization might come at this site, small flake production, through certain kinds of raw material conservation linked to people staying at one place for longer as a residential group, 
but being more mobile logistically. But that might not be the same as small fleet production elsewhere in the region, but until we are able to document the pattern and then compare it, uh, whether it's just calling it small and retouched flakes or giving it a more formal name, uh, I'm not too concerned about that. My goal is to answer the question. Um, I suggested we use a term because I think it might make it more efficient in the literature rather than writing this definition out all the time and having to reconceptualize every every study, we use a term that has a definition that's published. Um, but Stan's suggestion that we just include small flakes in the Kuhn and Elston list of things that characterize microliths does the job. Exactly. And so I'm quite happy. I'm not, I'm not trying to yeah. throw a concept on anyone. Um, and that's why I said we vote on this, uh, we, and I think <coughs> people voted with their feet. Uh, you know, uh, we basically just, and I, I'm quite happy. Um, but I think that in Southern Africa, the production of small flakes from small cores is not, it's not there all the time, um, and it pops in and out of the record. And we need to explain why that is. And I'm interested in that question, and therefore I need a definition that includes small flakes. Um, and that's why I'm going to use the Kuhn and Elston definition with small flakes included. So. Just a brief point about that uh, small flake. It, it's my impression that these kinds of small flake industries that you can observe from Kenya to South Africa don't exist outside of Africa. And so in one sense we're shackled to the rest of the world. Kuhn and Elston are not Africanists. Uh, well, maybe and all the of their assemblages are actually is. formal blade assemblages. Kuhn is an African. Well, he's become one, but in 19, in 2002, <laughs> when that was published, he was 15 years from Africa. Uh, but now, is this a product of uh, definitions, or is this real patterning in the lithic record? Well, I, well, that's the question. Is uh, are there small flake industries that are not micro blade lit? Uh, uh, blade lit, blade, blade lit industries out. Um, yeah. Yes. So the the Asina, the Asinopodian of uh, La Ferrisi is uh, the production of small flakes uh, from mm -hmm. small yes. level yeah. cores. Uh, potentially the material. Yeah, I think there are okay. instances. It's just that they are they're so idiosyncratic in their terminology that we fail mm -hmm. to link them to the patterns in Africa. Yeah. And that's why I was suggesting that. The, an, a macroevolutionary umbrella framework, while some people might argue that it's too broad to be of use, it's also broad enough for us to start doing the kinds of comparisons that might bring the Pharisee into a framework we could compare with Eastern Africa. Um, if small flakes are considered a genuine uh, process, uh, in, uh, as, as long as, uh, along with bladelets and, and back tools, uh, small flakes and bladelets mm -hmm. and sometimes artificial. For instance, you ask about the Natufian. So we have in the Natufian calls that in the beginning you take out bladelet to prepare lunate and then you are doing this, the work of Boris Valentine and Francois Valentine and you, you take out very small flakes, tiny flakes and as if the Bisson saw show you need to cut in it. So it's in the same trajectory, it's in the same uh, preparation of Shannon Pagota on the same core, even you, you switch your mind. So I think that the definition between the, the separation between platelets and small flakes is artificial because in the mind of the Nepal, when you prepare it, uh, those two trajectory on the same core, on the same margin, when it started to, to work. And the other thing I think that what is missing here is all this, the thing is of uh, technology. You have a different technological when you try to put a bladelet, you can do it a couple, couple of ways, not, and in order to, to prepare small flakes. And if you take those stigma, you can do it what are the, the different, different ways. But we also have the same products being made by completely different 
uh, trajectory is it? So yeah, I think that you know the four levels of intentionality include technology. <coughs> Uh, in order for us to investigate this phenomenon in more detail, we need to also adopt, uh, include an approach that documents the technology of, of these assemblages um, to see do specific products that are small result from particular reduction strategies. Uh, because you're, well, you're right that blade lid and flick is arbitrary. Um, we employ it. And the Tixia definition does very specifically employ blade lid as a separate thing. Even though I think I agree with you, the flakes and bladelets evolve quite together. Um, in some times, um, at least for us in Southern Africa, they do quite a lot. Um, but bladelets are a special case of a flake. In the definition of a bladelet, we say a flake that is twice as long as it is wide. Uh, at least in, in in many definitions. So, should we include just flake, uh, and then allow for specific Morphologies to define if it's bladelet or uh, or not. Just, just, just one detail. Uh, when you write uh, intentionality, I think the different word that you have written here, um, it, it should be important to develop a little more because a geology is not an intentionality itself. Uh, the raw material procurement is something. Uh, yes. Now, now you see, and even for technology, in a technology, you have different level of intentionality, which could be completely different. For instance, I, uh, uh, social control of uh, of, uh, of of the production in some in some industry where you have a specialized uh, nappers is. An, uh, uh, social intentionality, which has a role uh, to play in the, in, the, in the intentionality that you see in the technology, for instance, and it's a totally different than an other, uh, other level of intentionality. So if, if, if you want to use this, this, this four category, it's necessary to, to go much more deeper in the, in the definition of each of them. Yeah. To hierarchize yeah, yeah. yeah. to, to hierarchize the yeah. a little bit the, 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 the debate, because here treating them all on the same level is yeah. not necessarily the right way to do it, I don't think. Yeah, no, of course. This is just a uh, uh, yeah, no, sort of quick point of yeah. But Justin, as we heard from Stan, there's nothing stopping you of calling your techno complex the synthetic techno complex. And then others can try to, <laughs> to find exactly the same thing. Mm. Sure. You know, I, you know uh, again, it's not my purpose. You know. I know. Uh, the the research question is not can we make a new term. It's but can part we of identifying something new and the first time that it was identified as part of the archaeological. I'm just saying that we've heard it is the way to to go. You can give it a like name. you can if you wanted to. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, I have a very basic question here about the the four levels of um, intentionality. Uh, maybe two questions, but first, I'm not sure what uh, if I understand what you mean by intentionality. Can you elaborate on that? I mean, the idea is that uh, we should demonstrate that the process of miniaturization, miniaturization is a purposeful strategy, uh, that it's not accidental. Um, okay. Because then, we, we um, recognize that small products are, are a result of all mapping. Uh, they, so to differentiate these two, uh, accidental versus intentional. Mm. So the, uh, if the constraints on uh, size, for example, from the available starting size of raw material has already been ruled out, or is that in your geology? That's meant to be raw material selection. Okay. Uh, Glenn Isaac proposed a method of residuals, as he called it. Um, sort of Occam's razor, never explained by more what can be explained by less. And he identified the first uh, levels of that is to exclude the geological factors, the size and mechanical properties of raw material in the form of a lithic assemblage. So uh, geology, in a sense, is outside of intentionality, unless there are uh, uh, an abundance of raw material choices that you make. So if there are large blocks of obsidian, for example, uh, surrounding the archaeological site, yet they still make small blades, that's intentionality. Yeah. 
But uh, if it's the Omo Basin uh, 2.3 million years ago, and there's nothing bigger than a pigeon's egg pebble of quartz to flake, and indeed the most microlithic industries you can find, small flake industries, are the old one of the Omo Basin, uh, the, the center of the Omo. <coughs> Uh, all the French have dug those things up. So we can take it back practically to the beginning of, of small flake technologies. That's a geological constraint because the margin of the basin and correlated deposits that are also 2.3 million years old have access to large blocks of raw material and they made something that looks just like Old Divide Gorge. And even within Old Divide you have um, the Chert factory um, source. <coughs> and small flakes there. So um, intentionality, uh, uh, the ordering of these levels is important. Yeah, now, your see, highest yeah. level, as I see it here, is middle range theory. But there are higher levels of theory, obviously. Middle range theory is, is, um, middle, range. is middle range. <laughs> it's, it's a way of testing. No, higher level theories. But, but something very important from a conceptual point of view is that to, to, to determine the solution, which is miniaturization, you have to put uh, at the same level intentionality and constraints. And to see mm -hmm. how intentionality and constraints are okay. reactive all together to explain this solution in a particular, uh, mm -hmm. uh, as a, for instance, uh, it's exactly, uh, it's a part of the work mm -hmm. of André Leroy Gouran in 1940. Forty-four in milieu technique, it was exactly uh, the discussion between the milieu yeah. constraints in, in general, but it's not a, it, it's a little more complicated than by that in the world war, and intentionality in between both. And geology, for instance, uh, is a is a, is a constraint. Yeah, it, it's co it's a constraint and potential, but it means it's well mm -hmm. constraint and potential and intentionality and and and, and the. And when you cross both, you have some possibility uh, of solution and, and some not. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that marries the two points. Yeah. Quite nice. <laughs> yeah. So that's a very good point. I think yeah. uh, constraints and intentionality should be two separate lists, and yeah. sometimes yeah. they intersect <laughs> more than others. Okay. But I think that is still missing the higher level theory. And I think that's what I was talking about with territorial versus information sharing. Uh, social strategies, yeah. which do have the ethnographic support. Yeah. Um, so ethnographic analogy is not quite the same as middle range theory in that sense. So um, it's... Uh, <coughs> How, uh, sorry, can you explain that? Well, uh, when you talk about the theory of uh, um, that the um, technological organization since uh, Robin Torrance first developed the, the theoretical con concepts in 1983. Uh, and most of the literature since then has been organized around the concepts of um, uh, risk reduction uh, and curation and of, uh, organizing your technology for different degrees of risk. And some of the risk is mediated socially and some of it is mediated techno technologically and the social context of the technology is very important. Middle range theory is the middle. So there is a, a whole level of theory that um, uh, you would call intentionality and I would call intentionality and what I talked about is not represented here. But ethnography is, is part of that middle range. Ethnography is the support for some of these higher level reference. theories, yeah. such as mm -hmm. theories of uh, organization of technology to minimize risk of failure to acquire resources. Yeah. Um, so geology yeah, might come out and go in a separate list. Yeah, constraints. Uh, and um, uh, theory of uh, risk reduction. And, uh, this is not a new theory. Uh, Robin Torrance developed it in 1983 and a large part of the lithic community outside of Africa has used it quite profitably, mm -hmm. including Kuhn and Elston. I think uh, Peter Mitchell has used it quite extensively in South Africa as well. Yeah. I think so Steve. Steve. But yeah, uh, this, uh, this uh, workshop has made me think about lithic miniaturization, but in, in a kind of a different way. Why, at our side, for example, why do we have a, a stasis, if you want to say? Does it really exist? Because I'm sure there are specific changes that are taking place, but overall, 
you don't see that much change. Now, why did it miniaturize and then stay the way it did? Mm -hmm. That's another very interesting <coughs> that we'll explore in the future. Absolutely. Did it stay? Okay. Hmm? Didn't. It didn't stay. It didn't what? Stay? It didn't stay. The early up and down. Early Holocene in South Africa is mad. I'm talking about in my head. In Ethiopia, how do we see a lack of fluctuation? Well, do you? That's an interesting question. Different question. Steve? Yes, so I mean, of course, I think all these perspectives are, are indicating that, you know, again, um, we don't have a single, a single definition. We're not going to agree on one. But we do agree that the research questions provide the need for, for one in specific periods. Um, this is a, a rough list. Of course, we need to develop this a little bit more. Um, but this is work for the future uh, that, of course, we're all involved in collectively. So look forward to seeing the publications and all the takeaways from this discussion have seemed to be incredibly robust and alive at the moment from all regions of the world. And uh, just thank you for coming and cheering with us today. Um, so with that, can we have uh, anything else? Let's uh, read it, Casper. Uh,